This is To The Point, a podcast from LifePoint Church in Lebanon, Missouri, where we have real conversations about life and faith. Now let's get to the point. All right, welcome to Season 2, Episode 2 of To The Point. I'm John. I'm Kelly. And uh, we are here today with a couple of other pastors, and we are going to ask the question, basically, why plant churches? Yeah. And I'm going to let Kelly introduce these guys, and we'll get going right now. Yeah, I, I think this is a really important topic of conversation for not just for our church, but for all churches. I think when you think of the, the landscape, the spiritual landscape of our country, um, things are things are changing. And um, it, none of this should be a surprise to us, but I feel like there's a lot of people in the church that that don't really see it happening. We, we've kind of put our head in the sand and pretended that it's, it's not really taking place when, when the whole world around us is is slipping farther and farther away. And so I I have uh, two people here that I have a ton of respect for and um, that I think just add a a ton of depth to this conversation. I'll start with Bruce Rama, someone that uh, LifePoint knows. Uh, Bruce is a pastor, founding pastor of Legacy Church, and um, we plan we plan a legacy in 2018. Is that right? 2018, 2018, 14, yeah. yeah, we just turned three years old. Just turned three years old. And if I remember right, your very first day that you had church, there was like 34 inches of snow on the ground or something crazy. It like was that. crazy. <laughs> it was like 30 below. Yeah. That's why God has not called me to Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> but also with us is uh, Eric Dykstra. Eric Dykstra, to say he's the pastor of uh, Free Grace United is an understatement. He he is not only the pastor of Free Grace United, but he is a uh, he's a church planter. He is a church network leader. Uh, some people would, would say he's he's a bishop of churches because he leads multiple campuses and multiple churches, and he is. Uh, t- we're actually getting ready to have a m- big download from Eric tomorrow at a at a church planning uh, crash course boot camp kind of thing. And so, uh, Eric, how long have you been doing this uh, this church plant stuff? Since two thousand four, the end of October of two thousand four, we plant we planted our original church, and then in two thousand nine, we planted our first second location, and then went from there. And this last this last year during COVID, we planted five churches. So we have. 14 locations and one online location. The thing that I love about your story, Eric, is, is that last part that you shared is that in the middle of COVID, in the middle of the pandemic, when the whole world was going crazy, you surged forward and planted five new churches, yeah. which is amazing when every other church is closed. And we were talking just a second ago and uh, research from Barna, their, pre- their president, David Kinnaman, said that uh, in the next 18 months, which is not very long, 20% of churches are going to close. Uh, that's that's what the prediction is across. Them. That's one in five churches will close. Yep. That's that's huge. And mm-hmm. and we're talking rural churches. We're talking urban churches, suburban churches across the board. And that's just the United States. And so uh, let's have the conversation. Guys, why is church planning so important and why now? Uh, I would answer that question by the, my favorite way to answer that question is that if a church is older than 15 years old, it tends to get 90% of its growth through through transfer growth. Mm. So if a church is older than 15, it's going to get 90% of its growth through transfer growth. So if you actually want to reach lost people, you have to start more churches. Right. Because on the, on the flip side, you get about 85% of people with no church background or have been de-churched for more than five years show up to a new church yeah. where they don't do that to an established church. So the more we start new churches, our big, like we say, well, we're 14 churches. Yeah. But guess where the biggest, the biggest numbers of people being baptized are, are happening in the newer, the church, the more baptisms are taking place. Right. So that we just got to keep putting them out there and putting them out there. And then the other thing that's cool about that is uh, like our larger location, Elk River, if we're constantly sending people out, then this congregation doesn't get, bored and forget about evangelism right and just kind of sit in the seats because they know hey we're trying to send you out we're trying to get you to start something new we're trying to get you to go further we're trying to get you to see somebody else come to know christ best way to do that is go with another 30 40 people go start another church in another community or another neighborhood and you might reach your friends that you couldn't reach with this established church right and that keeps everybody on edge and kind of like on point for evangelism yeah i think i think comfortability is cancer in the church yeah, absolutely. When, yep. when we get really comfortable, we 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 we, we, we stop reaching yep. people. We forget who we are. Yep. We forget what we're here for, right. and we start having you know 
the, the classic, you know, terrible church debates like, you know, the church splitting because of the color of the carpet. I want to tell you right now, if, if people are coming to Jesus, the carpet's the last thing you're worried about. That's right. You know, yes. Bruce, and, and, talk and, to you, us. Yeah, and I might, I might answer it a little bit. Uh, well, similarly to Pastor Eric, but also in a little different way because we're located in a different setting. We're in a rural community. Thriving so, metropolis. No, <laughs> it is way out in Stickville. And so, um, you know, the the drive for people is not five minutes or ten minutes down the road uh, where you're reaching a couple thousand people. I mean... It's people drive for a half hour to go to church where we live. And so to me, like, not only is it a, a, a very biblical approach and a very biblical um, it carrying out, like, what how the first church started, you know, what, what Jesus asked us to do, love God, love people, and go and make disciples. To me, that that's really the, the proving ground of, making disciples is when we plant new churches in all yeah. these new areas. And like, for me, I, I'm real interested in statistics of regions of where, where I live. And I just heard a, a recent statistic that because of, because of our culture right now as a nation, uh, you know, we've got divorces are just skyrocketing and people are turning to addictions and, uh, and other means of escaping and, like, to me, the hope of the world is Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. Absolutely. And so um, when we, what we've noticed is that our newness has rubbed off a little bit. Now we're not so new anymore. But when we're new, people like new and shiny, yeah. not mm -hmm. old and dusty. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, part of that is there's an attraction because it's brand new. But planning the church that starts and roots itself as an effective church right from the get-go out of the gate though it's attractional because it's brand new it's effective and so the person who's coming in who's going through a, a split or they're going through a life issue they're coming in and they're they're experiencing something effective that's practical for their life right now so a little bit different from where 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 we're at in this state. Um, uh, but our culture up north, it's we're talking farmers and we're talking jack pine savages who they, they just are desperate right now. Yeah. And to me, that's like church planning is. And rural areas part. always get overlooked. Right. They really get overlooked. So when he's talking about being in a rural, a rural part of Minnesota, everybody in Minnesota who wants to plant churches, they want to go to the biggest town. They want to go to what's the, what's the fastest growing city and let's plant a church there. Cause there's tons of people yeah. for him to go to a small town and plant a church there. It's where people are in desperate need and there's literally no options, right? Yeah. No there's options. zero yeah. options there. Yeah. So there may be three or four churches that have been around for a hundred years, but their effectiveness, and I'm not trying to be yeah. negative about them, but their effectiveness is kind of worn off. Right. And so him putting a brand new church in a town like Pequot lakes, which has only got a couple thousand people, you know, that's going to be effective. Yeah. Because there's nothing there for people to hear the gospel like that. Well, it, it, particularly in rural communities, if someone's been to a church, they've went there for help before, maybe they were burned by that church and there's not a lot of options, maybe they've exhausted those options over 20, 30, 40 years of their life. And so a new church provides a new opportunity for a fresh start uh, where someone can come in. And you know what, what we found um, where we live is in the 417 area code, that is, uh, you know, Lebanon, Southern Missouri, it's 20%. Now, we're the buckle of the Bible Belt, right? It's 20% of the population on any given Sundays in church. Yeah, that would be us too. It, I, it might, actually, I think ours was like 17% the last time I did that thing. Yeah, kind of thing. I, I, think, I think ours has probably gone down because that, that stat's a little bit old. Mm -hmm. But as I, as I look at that, I'm sitting here thinking, man, there's, there's so much room for, for, for people to come to know the Lord. I mean, there's so so much room. And just one thing, Barna statistics. I mean, I've, I've been doing this church thing for a long time. It used to be someone who is an active member of their church was someone who went, you know, three or more times a month. Right. Now that statistic has changed to someone who goes once a month. That's 12 times a year. Yeah. That's an active yeah. Christian now. And so there's a, there's a shift in a standard. And I'm not sure... Uh, I'm not sure doing things the way we've always done them is going to change that. 
And it doesn't mean doing things cooler and having the best light show and the best stage or the best rock and roll. Like that's not what right. like what we're talking about. We're talking about what's the most effective way to plant something simple in a community that's effectively sharing the gospel. Mm -hmm. That's attractional yes. enough that when somebody's hurting and broken, people only come to church for two reasons. Check it out. Tension and transition. Yeah. Yeah. They come to church for tension or transition. They're going through some sort of transition in their life or they're dealing with some kind of tension. They're like, man, I, I should go. Maybe I should try church. Right. And that's why they show up on their own. Otherwise, the only reason they come is because a friend brings them. Right. So when somebody comes to church and we focus on how can we have the best light show or the best stage? And I'm not saying that stuff's bad, but when we focus on that versus, and these people are in need, this is a moment where they're like, they're in crisis. Let's just give them the gospel, give it straight yeah. to the point, simple. Here's the heart of the gospel. We're rescuing a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Eric, Eric talk to us real quick because your church went through a transition. I mean, uh, up here, um, Elk River, Minneapolis area, you you guys were a mega church and you're still a mega church. Um, but there was a shift in your thinking that's yeah. happened where you are, you're not leaning that way anymore. So, so talk us through that. So once I started realizing people are coming to church only once a month versus three times a month, and that's true. Those stats are true. And those are true for the mega churches. Yeah. So the churches with the best shows and the best bands and the best productions are still seeing people come less and less and less. So there has to be some other way to drive effectiveness mm -hmm. so that people want to engage in the gospel. Right. And a better show obviously isn't doing it. We've just had 20 years of people reinventing church and the result is less people are going. Right. Right. So there's got to be more to it. But yes. now I don't want to go back to old, we're just going to go back to the old ways. And I'm not sure that's the answer either. Yeah. Right. But there has to be a way in which we effectively present the gospel. So for us, that means uh, we will do some simple worship. Uh, we will do communion every week because we want to exalt the cross and not self-help. Right. So uh, we, even if our sermon is like helping people with a basic need, I want to make sure that someplace in the, in the, in the service they're hearing, no, this is all about Jesus. It's all about the cross. Right. So we'll do two or three worship songs. Uh, also, uh, men don't like to sing when they come to church. A lot of guys don't want that or they don't know how to sing and like it's right. weird. And so <laughs> they may just stand there and stare at you for the couple songs. Right. Then you get to communion and all of a sudden they can focus and it's like worship that they can't do with singing because it is like they weren't in choir. They don't know how to do that. Yeah. But then they open up communion and they're like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. this is the body of Christ broken for me. The blood of Christ shed for my sins. And all of a sudden they're focused on the cross. And then when that's done, we preach a simple 20 to 30 minute message. All of our locations have live preachers that preach the same outline yeah. and preach it to their own, to the best of their ability. Um, we end the service with a, with a final blessing and we're out the door. And we always help, always call people to an altar call and, and baptism. Yeah. Um, so last year we baptized in COVID, we baptized 179 people. Wow. Um, so far this year, we've baptized 29. So almost one person every day of the week of the year so far. That's great. Yeah. And it's because we're, we just, we just said, let's be as simple as we can and direct with the gospel. Mm -hmm. Bring your friends. You're going to hear a couple worship songs. Kids ministry is going to be good. Take communion. Hear the word of God preached. Go home, reach your friends with the gospel. That's all we're doing. And it has become night and day more effective than what we were doing before. Well, I think there's another aspect to what you're doing, though, that that I, I, that I think we, we need to, to shine a light on because this is necessary for church planning. You have to engage more people in the process. When every location that you that you launch, you're putting you know, 30 to 50 adults at, at minimum to put them out there. And those are not simply attenders. Yeah. Right. Those are people who had they stayed here at this location probably would have been attenders because there may not have been necessarily a role for them to fulfill. But now they go and they plan a church and they are serving. They're using their gifts. They're living according to their purpose and there's meaning in their life. And yeah. so when they see those baptisms, they know they, they get to be, part, be of part of that. Yes. There are two groups of people, I think, sitting in our seats. Uh, there are kings and there are priests. Uh, a king is somebody who has the ability to make money. Mm -hmm. and is financially successful to support the kingdom of Jesus. Yeah. And they may not be able to go to another location or go to another space, but they can fund all these other churches as they're getting rolling. The other people in our church are our priests, and priests are people who have the gift of evangelism. They have the gift of networking, and they have the gift of building people and taking people to Christ. And those people, man, when they may not have much money, but they can always go to with 30 other people to a new space 
and start singing worship songs and praying and reaching their community. And all of a sudden you combine kings and priests together into one space and you got financial resources and you got people who are willing to engage and connect with the lost people. And man, things can happen fast. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm, I'm going to add something here because uh, for the listeners, you don't know uh, that I served with and under Pastor Eric's leadership for a number of years. And I remember that he was, was our first, he was our first pastor here. Yeah, yeah, the, he was our first assistant pastor. There was a there was a, a a spiritual thing happening in my own life where one day I just it it like it clicked. I got it, and it was he was duplicating himself. Yeah, and I realized that was what Christ's great commission was all about was to duplicate himself mm-hmm. and replicate, multiply. Repli- multiply. and multiply yep. and. That's why if I were to answer in a short answer, why church planning, it's because I don't want any credit. <laughs> I just want to good. continue to multiply and duplicate what Christ has done in me and pull out, call out the, the potential in others and build them up in influence and let them go and disciple make them so they can go out. And, you know, we, we know as leaders and pastors that, you know, statistics are, you always, you always hear these various percentages and statistics of how many churches are closing in the United States. You know, one time, I think many years ago, it was 3,000 a year were closing. And then more than that, it's 1,500 it's a like month. 1,500 a month now. Yeah. 5,000. Now it's, I think it's now rising. It's yeah. crazy. Like these numbers of churches that are closing. And I believe that Jesus looks at us as leaders and, and ministers and says, Hey, do what I did and go out and be effective and share the gospel. Like, and I gave you a model that's listed right out there in Acts two. So, you know, Pastor Eric kind of walked over his service, uh, you know, like breaking a bread and prayer and fellowshipping together and being effective with one another, like do that, keep it really simple, keep it effective and build up somebody else and send them out and let them go. Because, we don't know, like, to me, I don't care if there's a church that plants up in a rural area in a town of 100 people and there's 20 people that go. That's a church that was needed in that region. Absolutely. And it's not it's not about having a huge monster building with a million people coming to it. Mm-hmm. As amazing as that might be for anybody to think of that, uh, it's it's. It's not about us it's, and and getting credit for doing that. It's all Jesus yes. yeah. and letting him empower people. And so I'm excited because I'm a I'm a, a, a product of a pastor that now I get to go and hopefully send out more pastors as Pastor Eric is doing and you're doing Pastor Kelly. And we get to watch these guys go out and one day as we grow old and, and look back on our life, we get to see all of these pastors and all these churches that are, are going and not closing. Yeah, that's effectively. good. That's that's really good. I'm going to add one more thing to what you said because I think that got me thinking. Disciple makers make more disciple makers. We just do. We just pass it on yeah. to the next generation, try to get them to go. Sometimes I'll talk to pastors and I'll, I'll say, hey, so tell me about the people in your church that you're raising up to be the next pastors or to be to send out or to... Uh, and they're like, oh, I don't do that. I always just hire from the outside. Hmm. Whenever I need a position or a thing. Like, and I always have this, this just a little thing for me that if we can't find people within our own church that we've raised up and taught the word of God and then taught to lead, I wonder if we're really making disciples at all. Uh, absolutely. Because then we're just, we got, we're hired guns all the time trying hmm. to, but if I'm raising up guys within the house and raising up women within the house and then they may go further than me, that's okay. Absolutely. Like, like let's, that's great. Let's applaud them as they go further than us. Think about it as a parent. You want your kids to, to be better than you. you want them yes. to be successful. Yes. That's that's a great measure on, on how well you raise those kids. Yes. You know, what's, it say, what's it say scripturally? That they reproduce after their own kind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, if we are disciples ourselves, then we should be seeing the fruit of discipleship replicated in our lives and our ministries. Absolutely. Not just in us, but in, in, in the people that we, we affect, particularly as we have a call to pastor, but not just pastors. We all have the call to disciple someone else. Yes. Just because you have the call of the gifting of the office of pastor doesn't mean you're off the hook for discipleship. Mm-hmm. We all have the call to, to disciple mm-hmm. someone and bring them on. Right. 
Yeah. Just listening in, I think this is awesome because we get to hear so many perspectives and see those threads that tie everything together and call back to what God has called us all to do, like what you just said. Uh, I love one of your uh, values is uh, something, not a monument, but a movement, something mm-hmm. to that effect. We're not a monument. We are a movement. I love that. And I think that is exactly what we are called to be as the church. We're not one monument in one place or we would have never left. <laughs> yeah. We would never be here. We would never be in this room talking, right? Um, I think like you, you were talking about letting go of, of the older, not wanting to fully return back to the old. I think what we've done historically through church planning, uh, through like that, the relevance movement, the super, everything's got to be super hip and awesome. Yeah. We kind of like overcorrected from wanting to, you know, get rid of or get away from traditionalism. And, you know, and we do that as people all the time. We overcorrect we're way far over here. And I think yeah. we're finding our way back to center, back to gospel, back to, and, and it's like more like reverence, not relevance kind of thing yes. where we're yes. focusing in on I agree. getting to the core of gospel. Like, how can we just go right to the heart? Because that communicates way better than an awesome show is going right. to communicate. That's and you know what's interesting authentic. about that is the Christian who's checking out your church cares about your lights and your sound and your show. Mm-hmm. But the non-Christian coming in the door that finally came in the door, they just want to hear what this place is about. They want to know if it's yeah. true. Is this <laughs> is the Bible real? Is yeah. this true? Yeah. Can it help me? They don't care at all. All and, about that. Person. Oh, yeah. And when it yeah. looks like a ripoff of culture or something like yeah. that, it's not all bad. That's why we don't get rid of it all. Right. But we also, we bring back some of that. I've, I've heard some churchy words as, we, as we've been talking, you know, and then coming back to that with some worship and communion sacrament stuff, yeah. you know, that connects in a different way. And it, it's about like kind of bringing those back in. And it's almost like you have to redeem something that's already redeemed. You know, yeah. you have mm-hmm. to bring people back in to say, hey, this is all good. This is this is what the church is about. But this is what it really is about. Yeah. You know, yeah. we can it make also, those idols themselves, you know. It also makes church planting so much easier if I'm not thinking I've got to raise $300,000 for a show. Right. right. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm going to recruit 30 people. I'm going to find a, a small space in a community center or a, a school or, or, or library or a bowl, yeah, bowling alley. And we're going to be get, we're going to buy a small sound system and we're going to begin to do church. Um, I'll give you an example. So we started a church in a little town called Malacca, which is, about 40 miles north of here um, in a little town of about maybe 800 people, maybe a thousand people, really small town. And this little town didn't have a very effective church. And so one of our guys started a recovery meeting in an abandoned building. He asked permission to use this abandoned building. They turned the electricity back on for him. He painted the walls. He cleaned up the toilets. He got them running himself. Started a little recovery meeting in there, got 25 guys to go, start going. I said, well, if you can get up to 25 guys to go, we'll turn it into a church. So we got it to about 25. Um, the building is so, so small. You could cram 50 seats in it, max. Wow. We put a little stage in one corner. Pre-COVID. Oh, this is pre-COVID. <laughs> uh, we put a little stage in one corner, put a, scr- put a TV on the wall, bought him a little sound system. For less than $3,000, we turned that into a church. Um, that church has baptized... I don't know how many people in the past two years, they just bought a 360 seat movie theater in wow. the last two months. And they're moving into that next wow. in that same little town. And so that they, they are going to be the biggest church in town. And they started <laughs> two years ago for $3,000. Wow. wow. That's, That's huge. Awesome. And yeah. all, all it was, was, Hey, let's meet some people where they're at. Let's pray for yeah. them, help them get sober. And it just turned into something. Yeah. And that was the start of how that, that, and it just didn't, we literally spent no money on that place. Even the guy who led it, we didn't pay him. <laughs> He's like, let's, and then eventually as it, as it grew, then you're able to help, right. him, help resource him and he can, but if you're thinking like that, you can plant churches really fast. Yeah. That's very different than the, the average church plant is $250,000. Wow. In equipment costs yeah. and rental costs to get up and off the ground. And, and even with that, you still have 80% failure rate within three years. Right. You know, I, I actually uh, know of a guy um, that was friends with his son that started to plant a church in Florida because that's where all churches need to be planted, I guess. <laughs> but they started with $2 million in the bank. Yeah. And they were very funded by a denominational entity. Started with $2 million in the bank, had six people on staff, had had two support staff. They had things that, that we didn't have until recently. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I've never with, had two million in the bank. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm talking about just, I'm talking about, I'm talking about stuff, that stuff. You know, they had everything. They, they had all the stuff that you could think. They had trained guys with you know yep. education. I mean, they had everything you'd think. And within five years, they were done. Wow. Yep. And, and it's not that the ministry they did isn't going to you know be fruitful in some way, but that entity that they started out to launch that church does not exist. Yeah. Now I know they touched people's lives. I, I know mm-hmm. great things happened. There was no big moral failure. It just, it, it did not, it didn't fly. It, it failed. Yep. I think about that with, uh, the, I helped plan the church in Albuquerque in 2011 and it was an amazing experience. It was awesome. But you know, within a couple of years, doors were closed. You know, I think it was, I think it made it like three years. So we, we left about almost two years in, it was about a year and a half. And I was like, this was really great for like, there was a lot of good gospel stuff that happened there, mm-hmm. but it was really great for Guitar Center and not super great for the gospel mm-hmm. as far as like longevity and being there and creating a legacy within the city and these goals that we had, these big dreams that God had given us. And, uh, and you know, it, and a lot of it was, it was like so much, so many obstacles to get through the door. It felt like, you know, of planning the church to get the doors open with all of these things that we had to buy, all these people we had to resource and all that stuff. And it's like, the most effective thing that we did was went to the bar and talked to the people on, the, you know, outside the fire pit and sat around and talked about Bible with these guys. That was the most effective thing that we did. And it wasn't even within the building that we were renting. It didn't cool. cost anything. It didn't cost yeah. us anything. And that's something I was going to hint at for the, the listener, really, because we talk about how much it might cost to, to start up. And if, you know, your church planner, listening in right now, like mm-hmm. hearing $250,000 yeah. to raise up to go and plant a church. Yeah. That's a, I mean, where are you going to get that kind of cash? Right. Uh, and we didn't have that type of bank. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's interesting because everything that we initially started out with in our location, like half of that stuff that we bought is sitting in crates in my garage. Mm-hmm. Right. And we just because realized, you realized you didn't need it. We realized yeah. we don't need like a 15 carts full of kids ministry stuff. You just, you can be effective without having it. So if you're listening, thinking about planting a church, one, you got to be a little bit crazy to do it. <laughs> I would say that. And then two, it's not like you have to, it, it's important to start with some, some bank. Yeah. You have to have some resources, you know, to fund your vision. In the same regard, you don't, you don't need to go out and go crazy and right. raise up a crap load of cash. And that has, that that's going to be your barrier right. to prevent you from starting a church. You just have to have the willingness and the drive and the ambition to be evangelistic and yeah. go yes. out and just say, I'm going to do it. I'm yeah. going to go do it. Right. No matter what I'm going to do it. Right. So one of the things we started saying around here, which is why I think even in COVID we started five, is we said we our churches need to be less like lilies and more like dandelions. We spring up everywhere and we're hard to kill. Yeah, yeah. We just spring up everywhere and we're hard to kill. Just like just little things good, up, yeah. over all over the place. Like, and so th- 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 when you think like that, I'll give you another example. This is this is my favorite one from the last year. Um, so one of our guys, he was our kids pastor here. I started sending him to downtown Minneapolis to the neighborhood where George Floyd was killed. Yeah, just go pray over people. So he'd been a kids pastor here for a while. So he'd go down every day and he'd just pray over people and pray over people and pray over people. Well, the more he prayed over people, I, like another guy at church heard about it. He's like, hey, I got an old warehouse in North Minneapolis. You can have it and you maybe use it as a staging area for, for your praying for people. So he went down and looked at it. The ceiling was Kate, like was had a hole in it. There was a big puddle of water. It was like 30 feet across right. on the floor. There were squirrels living in it. It was, I mean, it was, it was full of trash. It was nasty. He's like, I don't know what we're going to do with this. But then the more he's praying with people, they're, they're crying and they're needing God and faith. And so he paints the building. Um, he cleaned up the, he fixed the roof and the, the hole in the roof. He cleaned it all up. He got, he bought a grill, opened up the garage door in the front of it, and then just walked around to that community and passed out flyers and said, I'm going to do a free dinner for anybody who wants to eat. Yeah. And 30 people showed up. So when they got there and they started eating, he goes, Hey, you guys mind if we uh, play a couple worship songs for it? And they're like, we don't care. So they play like two worship songs. He goes, do you mind if I, I tell you a story from the Bible? <laughs> and they're like, we don't care. So he tells them this little story from the Bible. Right. And uh, 
that, and two, like one or two people are like praying to receive Jesus at the end of it. And he goes, do you guys like this? And they're like, he's like, yeah. He goes, what if I did it next week? Would you come back? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we would. Yeah. And he accidentally started a church overnight. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And that church two weeks ago had 115 people in two services. Wow. It has baptized a ton of people. It's only been around for four months. Wow. Um, and it's already running 115 people in two services in an old junkie warehouse that he painted wow. and just started feeding people. Wow. But, but I think, I think it's having, it starts with that compassion. It's, it's, well, I think it starts with love, with the love for, for Jesus and the gospel, you know, for you to say, why don't you not start praying with somebody that, that, that's seeing the need that's, you know, Jesus walked by, he saw the needs mm-hmm. that people had and what did he do? He fed them. He healed them. And he, yep. he, he, he did what he could. Now we're not him, but we get to be his ambassador. And so we go and we do what we can do. Paint a warehouse, fire up a grill. Yep. Sign me up. I'm the, I'm I'm in for that. You know, if I have, if I'm not going to church and someone's feeding me hamburgers, I'm I'm going to go do what they're doing. Yeah. You know, that's beautiful. In that simple you know what, church, man. You know, what? you didn't have to have didn't have to have seminary degree for that. I'm not against seminary. I love seminary. I think it's great. But but you don't you didn't have to have lots of experience. Didn't have to have a sound system. Didn't have to look cool. Didn't have to do. He just had to love people for Jesus, right. yeah. and it makes all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. You have you know like. A uh, budget's cool. Maybe eventually get a budget. That's cool. Yep. <laughs> uh, strategy's awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a place for it. Uh, great worship, killer sound, all the stuff. That's all great. But if we make all that the goal, right. then we we miss out on what we can do without that. You know, like what what happens when you take the guitars away, when you take this the sound system away, and when you take the budget away, and when you take the branding and the cool this and the, all the strategy and all that stuff away, are you still going to communicate Jesus to people? Are you still going to love people? Are you still going to care about the people in the community like that guy did? Mm-hmm. And he just sort of bait and switched. <laughs> we got a, yep. some burgers, and oh hey, by the way, we accidentally just had a church start. That's awesome. Yep. We, we just had a and church we called start it an accidental church, man. We just we, we didn't yeah. even plan on it. It, it was like perfect right. timing to use your words too. It was like tension and transition oh, right yeah. at the same time. Right. Yeah, like yeah. culture is oh, going yeah. through a transition, and a bunch of people tensed up, mm-hmm. and boom. Well, and this co- this moment. transition's happening real time right now yeah. across our country, across the world. There's no better time to plant churches than right now. Agreed. Yeah. No better time. And, yep. and so if, if you're People listening, are, are hungry for the gospel now than at any other point, because they're thinking about things they've never thought about in a long time. A lot of people don't think about death. They don't think about oh, yeah. crisis. They're not worried about the economy. Things have been pretty smooth for a long time in America. Right. Yeah. And now they're thinking about that stuff, man. Yeah. And they're and good it, opportunity to share Christ. We've yeah. lost a little bit of that kind of cultural Christianity over the years. Now there's fewer and fewer, like just speaking with youth and stuff like at our church, they're almost... None of them. I would say there's like maybe 70% don't have a church background at all. 30% maybe they have some parents or their grandparents maybe that have been a, a kind of a Christian influence, so to speak, on them. Uh, but the majority of them, there's no even idea of really what it's about. It's not something that's being talked about in their homes. They're, they're not familiar with, you know, the Bible or what it says. And that sounds like, oh, that's such a bummer. But it's actually a huge opportunity for us to come in there and teach a little bit of, you know, Bible, some prayer, some, you know, get back to that simple church like you talked about. And it really doesn't take much to let them know that we genuinely care and well, love them. That's like, the big deal. You know, yep. Barack Obama said, um, and it made a lot of a lot of Christians, a lot of conservatives mad. He said, we're no longer a Christian nation. Mm. And um, I think he was right. I wish we would be more offended <laughs> about people not knowing Jesus. Then that someone would make a yeah. statement that is so bold and so accurate, yeah, from the other side. Right. We have to understand that uh, Christianity is is not is not absorbed, not not learned by osmosis. Mm-hmm. It's it's something that that people need to be presented consistently with compassion and love, so they experience the love of Jesus, so they can trust Him. You know, there's so many things that are out there today that 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 point us to a false hope, a false gospel. It's everywhere around us. That's what I think most of the virtue signaling around us is but yeah. on social media. Yeah. But when we, f- we find ourselves putting all of our hope and faith in Christ, it changes not only us, it changes the way we see everyone else around us. I mean, he is the answer. No question. Right. Mm-hmm. And our, our, the question we have to ask ourselves and when we're planning churches or when we're it just in our churches every week, are we creating, are we, are we cultivating, are we growing Christianized people or Christ like people. Mm. Like we can Christianize the heck out of anything. 
We right. can do whatever we want to do and kind of make it look like all the right stuff and make people kind of have this kind of moralistic kind of view of, oh, this is all what it means to, and that's what I, why I feel like, you know, it's that cultural Christianity that we're kind of coming back out of, coming around to. And it's like a return to form in some senses. That's what we're talking about, you know, uh, but, you know, not, not taking away everything that we've learned and all the good points of, you know, this kind of last, you know, what did you say? The last 20 years of what church planning kind of looked like, the framework that everybody was under. Yep. We're, we're kind of going back a little further than that to kind of ask ourselves that question that probably all along we should have been asking, are we Christianizing a town or a group of people and making them feel real good about the, the way they're spending their time and the ways that they can kind of puff themselves up above the person next to them or whatever it might be? Or are we creating people and, and cultivating a, a group of people that can go out and do the same thing again down the street or in another state or whatever? Yeah. That's the biggest, that's why it stops to spread. That's what happens when it turns into a monument. That's mm -hmm. what the, what happens there. Yeah. And it's really detrimental and really sad. And I would, I would argue that the, the guys that have joined Pastor Mike down at that little church in North Minneapolis, yeah. serving food every week and effectively reaching people for Jesus in a very broken community. I would argue the people that have left this location and gone to that are probably more on fire for Christ than the people that are just coming to church and hearing my sermon every weekend. Yeah. And it is a better use of their time to be there serving with him mm -hmm. than it ever could be to be sitting in our seats here. Yeah. And I'm not trying to be critical about regular church at all. Right. But I do, you, you find people alive when they're church planting. You find them, yeah. they're feeling like their faith is being challenged. They feel like they're growing spiritually they, because that comfort level has gone and they've got to choose. And it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like when you're a kid, maybe you guys didn't do this, but we had an a above ground swimming pool, you know, four and a half feet deep. And so you get everybody in the pool together and you start walking around in a circle, create a kind of a whirlpool action. <laughs> and then you turn around and you try to walk in all that, you know, and there'd be all this current going against you. Well, when you got out of that, out of that pool at, right at that moment, you felt like the fastest person on earth because now there was no resistance. <laughs> you know, you're boom, you're going. And whenever we exercise our muscles of faith through church planting, through being engaged in that kind of service, that's exactly what happens. There's an invigoration that takes place within our spiritual life mm -hmm. that doesn't take place whenever we sit idly by and even, or even just kind of go through the motions of what we're doing in regular church. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so important that, that not just our church has a, has a goal and a plan for church planting. Uh, it's, it's that every church needs to grab this vision. And, and for the people that, that, that listen to this, that don't attend life point or they're not a part of free grace United, I'm ready for the church to quit being in competition with the church. Yeah. Amen. Agreed. Let's 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 be in competition with with the world and let's start bringing people winning people Agreed. from from the world instead of worrying about do we have more people than than First Baptist down the road or do we have more yes. people in the Methodist church down the road? Who cares about that stuff anymore? Cuz in the kingdom now, there's there's not going to be signs right. for yeah. that. It's, it's going to be it's going to be Jesus is Lord. That's it. That's right. Yeah. And so that I think that's one of the things that people worry about so much when it comes to planting churches. It's it's well, when how can I let everybody know what I've done? Well, it's not what you've done. It's what Christ has done. <laughs> that's right. and it's about glorifying him. Mm -hmm. So That's right. Well, we got a, a few more minutes here. Uh, so is there any last uh, things that we want to kind of talk about? Any questions you want to ask or anything? Close it out. If you could think of one, one thing to say to anybody that's considering being a part of a church plant, whether as a church planter themselves, as someone who feels called to be a support role uh, or whatever, what what's the one thing that you would say to anybody who's listening to this who's considering being a part of a church plant? Go for it. Well, the first thing I, I would add um, is if you're going to be a church planter, um, you'll realize that if you want to be even more on fire for God, then go plant a church <laughs> because uh, there is a, as a participant, as even a staff member of a church, uh, becoming a church planter, the level of spirituality and the, the level of fire, uh, the level of, of, um, encouragement celebration but also uh challenges and reconciliation that goes along with the territory of planting a church 
like your level of faith grows exponentially yeah. when you plant one. And to be part of, to go and, and say, I want to do this, you realize that you're stepping out of who you've always been in your faith to say, I'm going to get behind this. I'm going to support and, and, and carry out this mission with this crazy person who says they want to go plant a church in this community. And I want to do what it takes because I love this area that I live in and I love the people down the road from me. And I know their situation. I want to see them come to Jesus. So I want to get on board with this. That would be both to the planter and to the participant is you're, you're going to carry out the mission of Christ that he's called on your life. Yeah. And it's going to grow you up in a leadership level and a participant level at both at the same time. I guess I would say two things. One, well, three. Because the first thing I would say is it's not about going to a new church. So you're not just moving seats to a new place. Right. Right. That's right. not effective. So uh, when people think church planting, oh, I'm going to start a church in another community, and then I'm going to sit in that chair in that community. That's that's not what we're thinking. Right. Uh, when I think about somebody who wants to plant a church, what would I challenge you to do? Whether that's a volunteer or whether that's the pastor, it's two things. It's one, you prayer walk your community. And two, uh, as you're pray- praying and walking the community, then you're going out among the lost and actually talking with people who are far from God. When you said a minute ago you had more... You were more effective, not with your church that happened in Albuquerque, but sitting around that fire. Mm-hmm. That yeah. was more effective. That's because it is more effective. Yeah. It just is. Like, right. like yeah. planting churches is about praying with the lost and among the lost and talking to the lost. Yeah. And if that's not what we're about, if we're just about putting up another venue in another town, we're still not going to interact with lost people. Exactly. Right. And all it's going to be is just another group of Christians that had a Bible study in the town two two cities over, and it right. doesn't go anywhere. But if your goal is, I go out among the lost, and I'm praying for the lost. And that anybody can do that. Like, you just walk to... So when we started North Minneapolis, he just walked around town for a couple of weeks and prayed with people. Yeah. That was it. That's how it started. Yeah. And then as he's praying with them, they're sharing their needs. Right. He realizes some stuff. Hey, I could feed some people. God brought him an opportunity to feed people. He starts feeding them. God sprung up a church. Right. He didn't do it. Right. God did it. And I think if we started thinking in terms of church planting from that uh, that angle, I'm going to go out. That's Luke chapter 10, by the way. He sends them yeah. out. He sends them out two by two to a community. Um, and then he says, go and look for, to be a blessing in this town. And then as you're a blessing among this town, as when you when people are interested, you find people of peace and you share the gospel with them and they give their lives to Christ. So really it's about going to going to a place praying over people and interacting with lost people until you can find a need to meet. Yeah. And then as you do, churches will naturally spring up. Right. It'll just happen because God wants to meet needs. God wants to bless people. And then God wants to see people's lives transformed. And if that's your, your idea for going to a town, man, I don't, I don't see how that fails. Yeah. A, a passionate relationship with God translates into a passion for people. Yeah. Yeah. It has to. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's because it's his heart. As we develop more of his heart, you know, um, I was actually just telling this story to uh, to Lindell, who's uh, we're, we're planting a church with in Bixby, uh, Oklahoma. And uh, I told him, you know, as he's th- trying to figure out ways to kind of get their name out there. This happened seven years ago today. He came from my Facebook memories, which is funny. But um, we, we, we spent this big money on this advertising campaign. So newspaper, it was commercials on the TV, it was radio. Spent all this money on this advertising campaign, and we we tried to see how many people would come in, and it worked. We got people to come in. They they you know we had follow up material to see how they found out about us. And then directly after that, we we were in the series called Family Fight Club, and we made these fight kits. And what it was, we wanted to create something that was so good and so useful, and and would communicate love so well. So it was flu season, and so we've had this little box. And it said fight kit on the side and um, it had a sleeve of crackers, can of chicken noodle soup, some hand sanitizer. It sounds like a COVID kit, what it sounds like to me. You know, it had some lip balm, some some you know, Kleenex tissue, anything that you would want or need, cough drops, to fight the common cold. And, and we made 300 of those. And by the way, we spent way less on that than we did the advertising. <laughs> and when it came back to it, um, we told the people, 
take this fight kit out and give it to somebody who you know doesn't go to church. Don't leave it on their doorstep, knock and run away. Just give it to them. Say, pray about it. Who's, who's God putting on your heart? And here's, here's the thing. Um, statistically, we had 10 times the people respond to our church after that than we did with all the money we spent on advertising. And it came down to relationships. It wasn't about crackers and soup. It was about some you care for me. And this church empowered you to care for me. So I'm going to go check that out. And we still have people in the church today that are serving. That's cool. And, and That's their lives like are changed. That. You know, it, it's it's always about the relationships. 100%. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think that's uh, all the time we have. Uh, I would like, if anybody wants to know more info about Free Grace or about Legacy, if you guys just, what's the best way for people to see or to take a look at what you guys are doing? Is it just website? Yep. Freegraceunited.tv. Freegraceunited.tv. And what about yours? Legacychurchmn.com. There you go. Legacychurchmn.com. And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, which this one is a little less interactive with no the video. cameras, but there will be some audio out there. If you're listening to this in the background on YouTube or you're uh, listening on your device, please rate, review, comment, share all the stuff and let us know you're there. And um, if you have any ideas for the podcast, any questions for future episodes, please send an email to podcast at lifepointlebanon.com and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the To The Point podcast from LifePoint Church. For more information about LifePoint, visit us on the web at lifepointlebanon.com. Be sure to subscribe and rate this podcast, and be sure to share it with your friends on social media. Thanks for joining us for To The Point.